Chapter 3.27, Part 1 of Personal Narrative of Travels to the Equinoctial Regions of America during the years 1799 to 1804, Volume 3, by Alexander von Humboldt, translated by Thomasina Ross. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3.27, Part 1 Political State of the Provinces of Venezuela, Extent of Territory, Population natural productions external trade communications between the different provinces comprising the republic of colombia before i quit the coasts of terra firma and draw the attention of the reader to the political importance of cuba the largest of the west india islands i will collect into one point of view all those facts which may lead to a just appreciation of the future relations of commercial europe with the united provinces of venezuela when soon after my return to germany I published the Essai Politique sur la Nouvelle Espagne. I at the same time made known some of the facts I had collected in relation to the territorial riches of South America. This comparative view of the population, agriculture, and commerce of all the Spanish colonies was formed at a period when the progress of civilization was restrained by the imperfection of social institutions, their prohibitory system, and other fatal errors in the science of government. Since the time when I developed the immense resources which the people of both North and South America might derive from their own position and their relations with commercial Europe and Asia, one of those great revolutions which from time to time agitate the human race has changed the state of society in the vast regions through which I travelled. The continental part of the New World is at present in some sort divided between three nations of European origin. One and that the most powerful is of germanic race the two others belong by their language their literature and their manners to latin europe those parts of the old world which advanced farthest westward the spanish peninsula and the british islands are those of which the colonies are most extensive but four thousand leagues of coast inhabited solely by the descendants of spaniards and portuguese attest the superiority which in the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries the peninsular nations had acquired by their maritime expeditions over the navigators of other countries it may be fairly asserted that their languages which prevail from california to the rio de la plata and along the back of the cordilleras as well as in the forests of the amazon are monuments of national glory that will survive every political revolution the inhabitants of spanish and portuguese america form together a population twice as numerous as the inhabitants of english race the french dutch and spanish possessions of the new continent are of small extent but to complete the general view of the nations which may influence the destiny of the other hemisphere we ought not to forget the colonists of scandinavian origin who are endeavouring to form settlements from the peninsula of alaska as far as california and the free africans of haiti who have verified the prediction made by the milanese traveller benzoni in fifteen forty five the situation of these africans in an island more than three times the size of sicily in the middle of the west indian mediterranean augments their political importance every friend of humanity prays for the development of the civilization which is advancing in so calm and unexpected a manner as yet russian america is less like an agricultural colony than the factories established by europeans on the coast of africa to the great misfortune of the natives they contain only military posts stations of fishermen and siberian hunters it is a curious phenomenon to find the rights of the greek church established in one part of america and to see two nations which inhabit the eastern and western extremities of europe the russians and the spaniards thus bordering on each other on a continent on which they arrived by opposite routes but the most savage state of the unpeopled coast of oshkotch and kamchatka the want of resources furnished by the ports of asia and the barbarous system hitherto adopted in the scandinavian colonies of the new world are circumstances which will long hold them in infancy hence it follows that if in the researches of political economy we are accustomed to survey masses only we cannot but admit that the american continent is divided properly speaking between three great nations of english spanish and portuguese race the first of these three nations the anglo-americans is next to the english of europe that whose flag waves over the greatest extent of sea 
without any distant colonies its commerce has acquired a growth attained in the old world by that nation alone which communicated to north america its language its literature its love of labor its predilection for liberty and a portion of its civil institutions the english and portuguese colonists have peopled only the coasts which lie opposite to europe the castilians on the contrary in the earliest period of the conquest crossed the chain of the andes and made settlements in the most western regions there only at mexico cundinamarca quito and peru they found traces of ancient civilization agricultural nations and flourishing empires the circumstance together with the increase of the native mountain population the almost exclusive possession of great metallic wealth and the commercial relations established from the beginning of the sixteenth century with the indian archipelago have given a peculiar character to the spanish possessions in equinoctial america in the east indies the people who fell into the hands of the english and portuguese settlers were wandering tribes or hunters far from forming a portion of the agricultural and laborious population as on the tableland of anahuac at guatemala and in upper peru they generally withdrew at the approach of the whites the necessity of labor the preference given to the cultivation of the sugar-cane indigo and cotton the cupidity which often accompanies and degrades industry gave birth to that infamous slave trade the consequences of which have been alike fatal to the old and the new world happily in the continental part of spanish america the number of african slaves is so inconsiderable that compared with the slave population of brazil or with that of the southern part of the united states it is found to be in the proportion of one to fourteen the whole of the spanish colonies without excluding the islands of cuba and puerto rico have not over a surface which exceeds at least by one-fifth that of europe as many negroes as in the state of virginia the spanish americans in the union of new spain and guatemala present an example unique in the torrid zone namely a nation of eight millions of inhabitants governed conformably with european institutions and laws cultivating sugar cacao wheat and grapes and having scarcely a slave brought from africa the population of the new continent as yet surpasses but little that of france or germany it doubles in the united states in twenty-three or twenty-five years and at mexico even under the government of the mother country it doubles in forty or forty-five years without indulging too flattering hopes of the future it may be admitted that in less than a century and a half the population of america will equal that of europe this noble rivalry in civilization and the arts of industry and commerce far from impoverishing the old continent as has often been supposed it might at the expense of the new one will augment the wants of the consumer the mass of productive labor and the activity of exchange doubtless in consequence of the great revolutions which human society undergoes the public fortune the common patrimony of civilization is found differently divided among the nations of the old and the new world but by degrees the equilibrium is restored and it is fatal i had almost said an impious prejudice to consider the growing prosperity of any other part of our planet as a calamity to europe the independence of the colonies will not contribute to isolate them from the old civilized nations but will rather bring all more closely together commerce tends to unite countries which a jealous policy has long separated it is the nature of civilization to go forward without any tendency to decline in the spot that gave it birth its progress from east to west from asia to europe provides nothing against this axiom a clear light loses none of its brilliancy by being diffused over a wider space intellectual cultivation that fertile source of national wealth advances by degrees and extends without being displaced its movement is not a migration and though it may seem to be such in the east it is because barbarous hordes possess themselves of egypt asia minor and of once free greece the forsaken cradle of the civilization of our ancestors the barbarism of nations is the consequence of oppression exercised by the internal despotism of foreign conquest and it is always accompanied by progressive impoverishment by a diminution of the public fortune free and powerful institutions adapted to the interests of all remove these dangers and the growing civilization of the world the competition of labor and of trade 
are not the ruin of states whose welfare flows from a natural source productive and commercial europe will profit by the new order of things in spanish america as it would profit from events that might put an end to barbarism in greece on the northern coast of africa and in other countries subject to ottoman tyranny what most menaces the prosperity of the ancient continent is the prolongation of those struggles which check production and diminish at the same time the number and wants of consumers this struggle begun in spanish america six years after my departure is drawing to an end we shall soon see both shores of the atlantic peopled by independent nations ruled by different forms of government but united by the remembrance of a common origin uniformity of language and the wants which civilization creates it may be said that the immense progress of the art of navigation has contracted the boundaries of the seas the atlantic already assumes the form of a narrow channel which no more removes the new world from the commercial states of europe than the mediterranean in the infancy of navigation removed the greeks of peloponnesus from those of ionia sicily and the cyrenaic region i have thought it right to enter into these general considerations on the future connection of the two continents before tracing the political sketch of the provinces of venezuela these provinces governed till eighteen ten by a captain-general residing at caracas are now united to the old viceroyalty of new granada or santa fe under the name of the republic of colombia i will not anticipate the description which i shall have hereafter to give of new granada but in order to render my observations on the statistics of venezuela more useful to those who would judge of the political importance of the country and the advantages it may offer to the trade of europe even in its present unadvanced state of civilization i will describe the united provinces of venezuela in their relations with cundinamarca or new granada and as forming part of the new state of colombia m bonpland and i passed nearly three years in the country which now forms the territory of the republic of colombia sixteen months in venezuela and eighteen in new granada we crossed the territory in its whole extent on one hand from the mountains of paria as far as esmeralda on the upper orinoco and san carlo del rio negro situated near the frontiers of brazil and on the other from rio sinu and cartagena as far as the snowy summits of quito the port of guayaquil on the coast of the pacific and the banks of the amazon in the province of Jaén de bracamoros so long a stay and an expedition of one thousand three hundred leagues in the interior of the country of which more than six hundred and fifty were by water have furnished me with a pretty accurate knowledge of local circumstances i am aware that travellers who have recently visited america regard its progress as far more rapid than my statistical researches seem to indicate for the year nineteen thirteen they promise one hundred and twelve millions of inhabitants in mexico of which they believe that the population is doubled every twenty-two years and during the same interval one hundred and forty millions in the united states these numbers i confess do not appear to me to be alarming from the motives that may excite fear among the disciples of malthus it is possible that some time or other two or three hundred millions of men may find subsistence in the vast extent of the new continent between the lake of nicaragua and lake ontario i admit that the united states will contain above eighty millions of inhabitants a hundred years hence allowing a progressive change in the period of doubling from twenty-five to thirty-five and forty years but notwithstanding the elements of prosperity to be found in equinoctial america i doubt whether the increase of the population in venezuela spanish guiana new granada and mexico can be in general so rapid as in the united states the latter which are situated entirely in the temperate zone destitute of high chains of mountains embrace an immense extent of country easy of cultivation the hordes of indian hunters flee both from the colonists whom they abhor and the methodist missionaries who oppose their taste for indolence and a vagabond life the more fertile land of spanish america produces indeed on the same surface a greater amount of nutritive substances on the table-lands of the equinoctial regions wheat doubles yields annually from twenty to twenty-four for one but cordilleras furrowed by almost inaccessible crevices bare and arid steppes forests that resist both the axe and fire and an atmosphere filled with venomous insects 
will long present powerful obstacles to agriculture and industry the most active and enterprising colonists cannot in the mountainous districts of merida antioquia and los pastos in the llanos of venezuela and guaviare in the forests of the rio magdalena the orinoco and the province of las esmeraldas west of quito extend their agricultural conquests as they have done in the woody plains westward of the alleghanies from the sources of the ohio the tennessee and the alabama as far as the banks of the missouri and the arkansas calling to mind the account of my voyage on the orinoco it may be easy to appreciate the obstacles which nature opposes to the efforts of man in hot and humid climates in mexico large extents of soil are destitute of springs rain seldom falls and the want of navigable rivers impedes communication as the ancient native population is agricultural and has been so long before the arrival of the spaniards the lands most easy of access and cultivation have already their proprietors fertile tracts of country at the disposal of the first occupier or ready to be sold in lots for the profit of the state are much less common than europeans imagine hence it follows that the progress of colonization cannot be everywhere as free and rapid in spanish america as it has hitherto been in the western provinces of the united states the population of that union is composed wholly of whites and of negroes who having been torn from their country or born in the new world have become the instruments of the industry of the whites in mexico guatemala quito and peru on the contrary there exist in our day more than five millions and a half of natives of copper-coloured race whose isolated position partly forced and partly voluntary together with their attachment to ancient habits and their mistrustful inflexibility of character will long prevent their participation in the progress of the public prosperity notwithstanding the efforts employed to disindianize them i dwell on the differences between the free states of temperate and equinoctial america to show that the latter have to contend against obstacles connected with their physical and moral position and to remind the reader that the countries embellished with the most varied and precious productions of nature are not always susceptible of an easy rapid and uniformly extended cultivation if we consider the limits which the population may attain as depending solely on the quantity of subsistence which the land is capable of producing the most simple calculations would prove the preponderance of the communities established in the fine regions of the torrid zone but political economy or the positive science of government is distrustful of ciphers and vain abstractions we know that by the multiplication of one family only a continent previously desert may reckon in the space of eight centuries more than eight millions of inhabitants and yet these estimates founded on the hypothesis of a continuous doubling in twenty-five or thirty years are contradicted by the history of every country already advanced in civilization the destinies which await the free states of spanish america are too glorious to require to be embellished by illusions and chimerical calculations among the thirty-four million inhabitants spread over the vast surface of continental america in which estimate are comprised the savage natives we distinguish according to the three preponderant races sixteen millions and a half in the possession of the spanish americans ten millions in those of the anglo-americans and nearly four millions in those of the portuguese americans the population of these three great divisions is at the present time in the proportion of four two and a half one while the extent of surface over which the population is spread is as the numbers one point five zero point seven one the area of the united states is nearly one-fourth greater than that of russia west of the ural mountains and spanish america is in the same proportion more extensive than the whole of europe note notwithstanding the political changes which have taken place in the south american colonies i shall throughout this work designate the country inhabited by the spanish americans by the denomination of spanish america i call the country of the anglo-americans the united states without adding of north america although other united states exist in south america it is embarrassing to speak of nations who play a great part on the scene of the world without having collective names the term american can no longer be applied solely to the citizens of the united states of north america and it were to be wished that the denomination of the independent nations of the new continent should be fixed in a manner at once convenient harmonious and precise End of note 
the united states contain five-eighths of the proportion of the spanish possessions and yet their area is not one half so large brazil comprehends tracts of country so desert toward the west that over an extent only a third less than that of spanish america its population is in the proportion of one to four the following table contains the results of an attempt which i made conjointly with m Mathieu, member of the academy of sciences and of the bureau de longitude to estimate with precision the extent of the surface of the various states of america we made use of maps on which the limits have been corrected according to the statements published in my recul d'observation astronomique our scales were generally speaking so large that spaces from four to five leagues square were not omitted we observed this degree of precision that we might not add the uncertainty of the measure of triangles trapeziums and the sinuosities of the coasts to the uncertainty of geographical statement table of great political divisions column one name column two surface in square leagues of twenty to an equinoctial degree column three population eighteen twenty three one possessions of the spanish americans surface three hundred and seventy one thousand three hundred and eighty population sixteen million seven hundred and eighty five thousand mexico or new spain surface seventy five thousand eight hundred and thirty population six million eight hundred guatemala surface sixteen thousand seven hundred and forty population one million six hundred thousand cuba and puerto rico surface four thousand four hundred and thirty population eight hundred thousand colombia venezuela surface thirty three thousand seven hundred population seven hundred and eighty five thousand colombia new granada and quito surface fifty eight thousand two hundred and fifty population two million peru surface forty one thousand four hundred and twenty population one million four hundred thousand chile surface fourteen thousand two hundred and forty population one million one hundred thousand buenos aires surface one hundred and twenty six thousand seven hundred and seventy population two million three hundred thousand possessions of the portuguese americans brazil surface two hundred and fifty six thousand nine hundred and ninety population four million possessions of the anglo-americans united states surface one hundred and seventy four thousand three hundred population ten million two hundred and twenty thousand from the statistical researches which have been made in several countries of europe important results have been obtained by a comparison of the relative population of maritime and inland provinces in spain these relations are to one another as nine to five in the united provinces of venezuela and above all in the ancient capitania general of caracas they are as thirty-five to one how powerful soever may be the influence of commerce on the prosperity of states and the intellectual development of nations it would be wrong to attribute in america as we do in europe to that cause alone the differences just mentioned in spain and italy if we accept the fertile plains of lombardy the inland districts are arid and abounding in mountains or high tablelands the meteorological circumstances on which the fertility of the soil depends are not the same in the lands bordering on the sea as they are in the central provinces colonization in america has generally begun on the coast and advanced slowly toward the interior such is its progress in brazil and in venezuela it is only where the coast is unhealthy as in mexico and new granada or sandy and exempt from rain as in peru that the population is concentrated on the mountains and the tablelands of the interior these local circumstances are too often overlooked in considerations on the future fate of the spanish colonies they communicate a peculiar character to some of those countries the physical and moral analogies of which are less striking than is commonly supposed consider with reference to the distribution of the population the two provinces of new granada and venezuela which have been united in one political body and exhibit the most complete contrast their capitals and the position of capitals always denotes where population is most concentrated are at such unequal distances from the trading coasts of the caribbean sea that the town of caracas to be placed on the same parallel with santa fe de bogota must be transplanted southward to the junction of the orinoco with the guaviare 
where the mission of San Fernando de Atabapo is situated. The Republic of Colombia is, with Mexico and Guatemala, the only state of Spanish America which occupies at once the coasts opposite to Europe and to Asia. From Cape Paraya to the western extremity of Veragua is a distance of 400 sea leagues, and from Cape Burica to the mouth of Rio Tumbes the distance is 260. The shore possessed by the Republic of Colombia consequently equals in length the line of coasts extending from Cadiz to Danzig or from Queta to Jaffa. This immense resource for national industry is combined with a degree of cultivation of which the importance has not hitherto been sufficiently acknowledged. The Isthmus of Panama forms part of the territory of Colombia, and that neck of land, if traversed by good roads and stocked with camels, may one day serve as a portage for the commerce of the world, even though the plains of Cupica, the Bay of Mandinga, or the Rio Chagre should not afford the possibility of a canal for the passage of vessels proceeding from Europe to China, or from the United States to the northwest coast of America. Note the old viceroyalty of buenos aires extended also along a small portion of the south sea coast end of note end of chapter three point twenty seven part one chapter three point twenty seven part two of personal narrative of travels to the equinoctial regions of america during the years seventeen ninety nine to eighteen o four volume three by Alexander von Humboldt, translated by Thomasina Ross. The Slipperbox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3.27, Part 2. When considering the influence which the configuration of countries, that is, the elevation and the form of coasts, exercises in every district on the progress of civilization and the destiny of nations, I have pointed out the disadvantages of those vast masses of triangular continents, which, like Africa, and the greater part of South America, are destitute of gulfs and inland seas. It cannot be doubted that the existence of the Mediterranean has been closely connected with the first dawn of human civilization among the nations of the West, and that the articulated form of the land, the frequency of its contractions, and the concatenation of peninsulas favored the civilization of Greece, Italy, and perhaps of all Europe, westward of the meridian of the Propontis. In the New World, the uninterruptedness of the coasts and the monotony of their straight lines are most remarkable in Chile and Peru. The shore of Colombia is more varied, and its spacious gulfs, such as that of Paraya, Cariaco, Maracaibo, and Derien, were, at the time of the first discovery, better peopled than the rest, and facilitated the interchange of productions. That shore possesses an incalculable advantage in being washed by the Caribbean Sea a kind of inland sea with several outlets, and the only one pertaining to the new continent. This basin, whose various shores form portions of the United States, the Republic of Colombia, of Mexico, and several maritime powers of Europe, gives birth to a peculiar and exclusively American system of trade. The southeast of Asia, with its neighboring archipelago, and above all, the state of the Mediterranean, in the time of the Phoenician and Greek colonies, prove that the nearness of opposite coasts, not having the same productions, and not inhabited by nations of different races, exercises a happy influence on commercial industry and intellectual cultivation. The importance of the inland Caribbean Sea, bounded by Venezuela on the south, will be further augmented by the progressive increase of population on the banks of the Mississippi, for that river, the Rio del Norte and the Magdalena, are the only great navigable streams which the Caribbean Sea receives. The depth of the American rivers, their immense branches, and the use of steamboats, everywhere facilitated by the proximity of forests, will, to a certain extent, compensate for the obstacles which the uniform line of the coasts and the general configuration of the continent oppose to the progress of industry and civilization. On comparing the extent of the territory with the absolute population, we obtain the result of the connection of those two elements of public prosperity, a connection that constitutes the relative population of every state in the New World. We shall find to every square sea league in Mexico, 90, in the United States, 58, in the Republic of Colombia, 30, and in Brazil, 15, inhabitants, while Asiatic Russia furnishes 11, the whole Russian Empire, 87, Sweden with Norway, 90, European Russia, 320, 
Spain, 763, and France, 1,778. But these estimates of relative population, when applied to countries of immense extent, and of which a great part is entirely uninhabited, merely furnish mathematical abstractions of but little value. In countries uniformly cultivated, in France, for example, the number of inhabitants to the square league, calculated by separate departments, is in general only a third more or less than the relative population of the sum of all the departments. Even in Spain, the deviations from the average number rise, with few exceptions, only from half to double. In America, on the contrary, it is only in the Atlantic states, from South Carolina to New Hampshire, that the population begins to spread with any uniformity. In that most civilized portion of the New World, from 130 to 900 inhabitants are reckoned to the square league, while the relative population of all the Atlantic states together is 240. The extremes, North Carolina and Massachusetts, are only in the relation of one to seven, nearly as in France, where the extremes in the departments of the haute alpe and the Côte du Nord are also in the relation of one to 6.7. The variations from the average number which we generally find restricted to narrow limits in the civilized countries of Europe, exceed all measure in Brazil, in the Spanish colonies, and even in the Confederation of the United States, in its whole extent. We find in Mexico, in some of the Intendencias, for example, La Sonora and Durango, from nine to fifteen inhabitants to the square league, while in others, on the central tableland, there are more than five hundred. The relative population of the country situated between the eastern bank of the Mississippi and the Atlantic states is scarcely 47, while that of Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts is more than 800. Westward of the Mississippi, as well as in the interior of Spanish Guiana, there are not two inhabitants to the square league over much larger extents of territory than Switzerland or Belgium. The state of these countries is like that of the Russian Empire where the relative population of some of the Asiatic governments, Irkutsk and Tobolsk, is to that of the best cultivated European districts as one to three hundred. The enormous difference existing in countries newly cultivated between the extent of territory and the number of inhabitants renders these partial estimates necessary. When we learn that New Spain and the United States, taking their entire extent at 75,000 and 174,000 square sea leagues, give respectively ninety and fifty-eight souls to each league, we no more obtain a correct idea of that distribution of the population on which the political power of the nation depends than we should of the climate of the country, that is to say, of the distribution of the heat in the different seasons by the mere knowledge of the mean temperature of the whole year. If we take from the United States all their possessions west of the Mississippi, their relative population would be 121 instead of 58, to the square league, consequently much greater than that of New Spain. Taking from the latter country the provincias internas, north and northeast, of Nueva Galicia, we should find 190 instead of 90 souls to the square league. The provinces of Caracas, Maracaibo, Cumana, and Barcelona, that is, the maritime provinces of the north, are the most populous of the old Capitania General of Caracas but in comparing this relative population with that of New Spain, where the two intendencias of Mexico and Puebla alone contain, on an extent scarcely equal to the superficies of the province of Caracas, a greater population than that of the whole Republic of Colombia, we see that some Mexican intendencias which, with respect to the concentration of their culture, occupy but the seventh or eighth rank, Zacatecas and Guadalajara, contain more inhabitants to the square league than the province of Caracas. The average of the relative population of Cumana, Barcelona, Caracas, and Maracaibo is 56. And, as 6,200 square leagues, that is, one half of the extent of these four provinces, are almost desert llanos, we find, in reckoning the superficies and the scanty population of the plains, 102 inhabitants to the square league. An analogous modification gives the province of Caracas alone a population of 208, that is, only one-seventh less than that of the Atlantic states of North America. As in political economy, numerical statements become instructive only by a comparison with analogous facts. I have carefully examined what, 
in the present state of the two continents might be considered as a small relative population in europe and a very great relative population in america i have however chosen examples only from among the provinces which have a continued surface of more than six hundred square leagues in order to exclude the accidental accumulations of population which occur around great cities for instance on the coast of brazil in the valley of mexico on the tablelands of santa fe de bogota and cusco or finally in the smaller west india islands barbados martinique and st thomas of which the relative population is from three thousand to four thousand seven hundred inhabitants to the square league and consequently equal to the most fertile parts of holland france and lombardy table minimum of europe inhabitants to the square league the four least populous governments of european russia archangel ten holones forty two wologda and astrakhan fifty two finland one hundred and six the least populous province of spain that of Cuenca, 311. The Duchy of Lüneburg, on account of the heaths, 550. The least populous department of continental France, haute Alpes, 758. Departments of France thinly populated, the Creuse, the Var, and the Aude, 1,300. Maximum of America, the central part of the intendencias of Mexico and Puebla, above, 1,300. In the United States, Massachusetts, but having only 522 square leagues of surface, 900. Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut together, 840. The whole intendencia of Puebla, 540. The whole intendencia of Mexico, 460. These two Mexican intendencias together are nearly a third of the superficial extent of France, with a suitable population. In 1823, nearly 2,800,000 souls, to prevent the towns of mexico and puebla from having a sensible influence on the relative population northern part of the province of caracas two hundred and eight without the llanos this table shows that those parts of america which we now consider as the most populous attain the relative population of the kingdom of navarre of galicia and of asturias which next to the province of guipuzco and the kingdom of valencia reckon the greatest number of inhabitants to the square league in all spain the maximum of america is however below the relative population of the whole of france one thousand seven hundred and seventy eight to the square league and would in the latter country be considered as a very thin population if taking a survey of the whole surface of america we direct our attention to the capitania general of venezuela we find that the most populous of its subdivisions the province of caracas considered as a whole without excepting the llanos has as yet only the relative population of tennessee and that this province without the llanos furnishes in its northern part or more than one thousand eight hundred square leagues the relative population of south carolina those one thousand eight hundred square leagues the centre of agriculture are twice as numerously peopled as finland but a third less than the province of cuenca which is the least populous of all spain we cannot dwell on this result without a painful feeling such is the state to which colonial politics and maladministration have during three centuries reduced a country which for natural wealth may vie with all that is most wonderful on earth for a region equally desert we must look either to the frozen regions of the north or westward of the allegheny mountains toward the forests of tennessee where the first clearings have only begun within the last eighty years the most cultivated part of the province of caracas the basin of the lake of valencia commonly called los Valles de aragua contained in eighteen ten nearly two thousand inhabitants to a square league supposing a relative population three times less and taking off from the whole surface of the capitania general nearly twenty four thousand square leagues as being occupied by the llanos and the forests of guiana and therefore presenting great obstacles to agricultural laborers we should still obtain a population of six millions for the remaining nine thousand seven hundred square leagues those who like myself have lived long within the tropics will find no exaggeration in these calculations for i suppose for the portion the most easily cultivated a relative population equal to that in the intendencias of puebla and mexico full of barren mountains and extending toward the coast of the pacific over regions almost desert 
Note. These two intendencias contain together 5,520 square leagues and a relative population of 508 inhabitants to the square sea league. End of note. If the territories of Cumana, Barcelona, Caracas, Maracaibo, Varinas, and Guyana should be destined hereafter to enjoy good provincial and municipal institutions as confederate states, they will not require a century and a half to attain a population of six millions of inhabitants. Venezuela, the eastern part of the Republic of Colombia, would not, even with nine millions, have a more considerable population than old Spain, and can it be doubted that that part of Venezuela, which is most fertile and easy of cultivation, that is, the ten thousand square leagues remaining after deducting the llanos and the almost impenetrable forests between the Orinoco and the Casiquiare, could support in the fine climate of the tropics as many inhabitants as ten thousand square leagues of the Estremadura, the Castiles, and other provinces of the tableland of Spain? These predictions are by no means problematical, inasmuch as they are founded on physical analogies and on the productive power of the soil. But before we can indulge the hope that they will be actually accomplished, we must be secure of another element less susceptible of calculation, that national wisdom which subdues hostile passions, destroys the germs of civil discord, and gives stability to free and energetic institutions. When we take a view of the soil of Venezuela and New Granada, we perceive that no other country of Spanish America furnishes commerce with such various and rich productions of the vegetable kingdom. If we add the harvests of the province of Caracas to those of Guayaquil, we find that the Republic of Colombia alone can furnish nearly all the cacao annually demanded by Europe. The Union of Venezuela and New Granada has also placed in the hands of one people the greater part of the quinquina exported from the new continent. The temperate mountains of Merida, Santa Fe, Popayan, Quito, and Loja produce the finest quantities of this febrifugal bark hitherto known. I might swell the list of these valuable productions by the coffee and indigo of Caracas, so long esteemed in commerce, the sugar cotton and flour of Bogota, the ipecacuana of the banks of the Magdalena, the tobacco of Varinas, the cortex angosturae of Caroni, the balsam of the plains of Tolu, the skins and dried provisions of the Llanos, the pearls of Panama, Rio Hacha and Margarita, and finally the gold of Papayan, and the platinum, which is nowhere found in abundance but at Choco and Barbacoa. But conformably with the plan I have adopted, I shall confine myself to the old Capitania General of Caracas. Owing to a peculiar disposition of the soil in Venezuela, the three zones of agricultural, pastoral, and hunting life succeed each other from north to south, along the coast in the direction of the equator. Advancing in that direction, we may be said to traverse, in respect to space, the different stages through which the human race has passed in the lapse of ages, in its progress toward civilization, and in laying the foundations of civilized society. The region of the coast is the center of agricultural industry. The region of the Llanos serves only for the pasturage of the animals which Europe has given to America, and which live there in a half-wild state. Each of those regions includes from seven to eight thousand square leagues. Further south, between the delta of the Orinoco, Quasiquiare, and the Rio Negro, lies a vast extent of land, as large as France, inhabited by hunting nations, covered with thick forests and impassable swamps. The productions of the vegetable kingdom belong to the zones at each extremity. The intermediary savannas, into which oxen, horses, and mules were introduced about the year 1548, afford food for some millions of those animals. At the time when I visited Venezuela, the annual exportation from thence to the West India Islands amounted to 30,000 mules, 174,000 ox hides, and 140,000 orobas of 25 pounds of tasajo, or dried meat, slightly salted. Note. The back of the animal is cut in slices of moderate thickness. An ox or cow of the weight of twenty-five arrobas produces only four to five arrobas of tasajo or tasso. In 1792, the port of Barcelona alone exported 98,017 arrobas to the island of Cuba. The average price is 14 reals and varies from 10 to 18. The real is worth about six and a half pence English. 
Monsieur Urquisana estimates the total exportation of Venezuela in 1809 at 200,000 orobas of Tasajo. End of note. It is not from the advancement of agriculture or the progressive encroachments on the pastoral lands that the hatos, herds and flocks, have diminished so considerably within twenty years. It is rather owing to the disorders of every kind that have prevailed, and the want of security for property. The impunity conceded to the skin-stealers, and the accumulation of marauders in the savannas, preceded that destruction of cattle caused by the ravages of civil war and the supplies required for troops. A very considerable number of goat-skins is exported to the islands of Margareta, Punta Araya, and Corolas. Sheep only abound in Corora and Tucuyo. The consumption of meat being immense in this country, the diminution of animals has a greater influence here than in any other district on the well-being of the inhabitants. The town of Caracas, of which the population in my time was one-tenth of that of Paris, consumed more than one-half the quantity of beef annually used in the capital of France. I might add to the productions of the vegetable and animal kingdoms of Venezuela the enumeration of the minerals, the working of which is worthy of the attention of the government. But having from my youth been engaged in the practical labors of mines, I know how vague and uncertain are the judgments formed of the metallic wealth of a country from the mere appearance of the rocks and of the veins in their beds. The utility of such labors can be determined only by well-directed experiments, by means of shafts or galleries. All that has been done in researches of this kind, under the dominion of the mother country, has left the question wholly undecided, and the most exaggerated ideas have been recently spread through Europe concerning the riches of the mines of Caracas. The common denomination of Colombia, given to Venezuela and New Granada, has doubtless contributed to foster those illusions. It cannot be doubted that the gold washings of New Granada furnished, in the last years of public tranquillity, more than 18,000 marks of gold, that Choco and Barbacoa supply platinum in abundance, the valley of Santa Rosa in the province of Antioquia, the Andes of Quindiu, and Guasum near Cuenca yielded sulphuretted mercury, the tableland of Bogota near Zipiquira and Canoas, fossil salt and pit coal, but even in New Granada, subterranean labors on the silver and gold veins have hitherto been very rare. I am far, however, from wishing to discourage the miners of those countries. I merely conceive that for the purpose of proving to the old world the political importance of Venezuela, the amazing territorial wealth of which is founded on agriculture and the produce of pastoral life, it is not necessary to describe as realities or as the acquisition of industry what is, as yet, founded solely on hopes and probabilities more or less certain. The Republic of Colombia also possesses on its coast, on the island of Margareta, on the Rio Hacha, and in the Gulf of Panama pearl fisheries of ancient celebrity. In the present state of things, however, fishing for these pearls is an object of as little importance as the exportation of the metals of Venezuela. The existence of metallic veins on several points of the coast cannot be doubted. Mines of gold and silver were worked at the beginning of the conquest at Buria, near Barquisimeto, in the province of Los Mariches, at Baruta, on the south of Caracas, and at Real de Santa Barbara, near the Via de Cura. Grains of gold are found in the whole mountainous territory between Rio Yaracui, the Via de San Felipe, and Nirgua, as well as between Guigue and Los Moros de San Juan. M. Bonpland and myself, during our long journey, saw nothing in the nice granite of Spanish Guiana to confirm the old faith in the metallic wealth of that district. Yet it seems certain, from several historical notices, that there exist two groups of auriferous alluvial land, one between the sources of the Rio Negro, the Uaupes, and the Iquiare, the other between the sources of the Essequibo, the Caroni, and the Rupunuri. Hitherto, only one working is found in Venezuela, that of Aroa. It furnished in 1800 near fifteen hundred quintiles of copper of excellent quality. The greenstone rocks of the transition mountains of Tucutumeno, between Via de Cura and Parapara, contain veins of malachite and copper pyrites. The indications of both ochreous and magnetic iron in the coast chain, the native alum of Chuparipari, the salt of Araya, the kaolin of the Silla, the jade of the upper Orinoco, the petroleum of Buen Pastor, and the sulphur of the eastern part of new andalusia equally merit the attention of the government 
it is easy to ascertain the existence of some mineral substances which afford hopes of profitable working but it requires great circumspection to decide whether the mineral be sufficiently abundant and accessible to cover the expense note in eighteen hundred a day labourer peon employed in working the ground gained in the province of caracas fifteen sous exclusive of his food a man who hewed building timber in the forests on the coast of praia was paid at cumana forty-five to fifty sous a day without his food a carpenter gained daily from three to six francs in new andalusia three cakes of cassava the bread of the country twenty-one inches in diameter one and a half lines thick and two and a half pounds weight cost at caracas one half real or six and a half sous a man daily eats not less than two sous worth of cassava that food being constantly mixed with bananas dried meat tasajo and panelon or refined sugar end of note even in the eastern part of south america gold and silver are found dispersed in a manner that surprises the european geologist but that dispersion together with the divided and entangled state of the veins and the appearance of some metals only in masses render the working extremely expensive the example of mexico sufficiently proves that the interest attached to the labours of the mines is not prejudicial to agricultural pursuits and that those two branches of industry may simultaneously promote each other the failure of the attempts made under the intendant don jose avalo must be attributed solely to the ignorance of the persons employed by the spanish government who mistook mica and hornblende for metallic substances if the government would order the capitania general of caracas to be carefully examined during a series of years by men of science well versed in geognosy and chemistry the most satisfactory results might be expected End of chapter three point twenty seven part two chapter three point twenty seven part three of personal narrative of travels to the equinoctial regions of america during the years seventeen ninety nine to eighteen o four volume three by alexander von humboldt translated by thomasina ross the slibrivox recording is in the public domain chapter three point twenty seven part three the description above given of the productions of venezuela and the development of its coast sufficiently shows the importance of the commerce of that rich country even under the thraldom of the colonial system the value of the exported products of agriculture and of the gold washings amount to eleven or twelve millions of piastres in the countries at present united under the denomination of the republic of colombia the exports of the capitania general of caracas alone exclusive of the precious metals which are the objects of regular working was with the contraband from five to six millions of piastres at the beginning of the nineteenth century cumana barcelona la guayra porto cabello and maracaibo are the most important parts of the coast those that lie most eastward have the advantage of an easier communication with the virgin islands guadeloupe martinique and st vincent angostura the real name of which is santo tome de nueva guiana may be considered as the port of the rich province of varinas the majestic river on whose banks this town is built affords by its communications with the apure the meta and the rio negro the greatest advantage for trade with europe the shores of venezuela from the beauty of their ports the tranquillity of the sea by which they are washed and the fine timber that covers them possess great advantages over the shores of the united states in no part of the world do we find firmer anchorage or better positions for the establishment of ports the sea of this coast is constantly calm like that which extends from lima to guayaquil the storms and hurricanes of the west indies are never felt on the costa firme and when after the sun has passed the meridian thick clouds charged with electricity accumulate on the mountains of the coasts a pilot accustomed to these latitudes knows that this threatening aspect of the sky denotes only a squall the virgin forests near the sea in the eastern part of new andalusia present valuable resources for the establishment of dockyards the wood of the mountains of paria may vie with that of the island of cuba wasaquaco guayaquil and san blas the spanish government at the close of the last century fixed its attention on this important object marine engineers were sent to mark the finest trunks of brazil wood mahogany cedrella and laurinia between angostura and the mouth of the orinoco as well as on the banks of the gulf of paria commonly called the golfo triste 
It was not intended to establish docks on that spot, but to hew the weighty timber in the forms necessary for shipbuilding, and transport it to Caracue, near Cadiz. Though trees fit for masts are not found in this country, it was nevertheless hoped that the execution of this project would considerably diminish the importance of timber from Sweden and Norway. The experiment of forming this establishment was tried in a very unhealthy spot, the valley of Quebranta, near Guiri. I have already averted to the causes of its destruction. The insalubrity of the place would doubtless have diminished in proportion as the forest, El Monte Virgin, should have been removed from the dwellings of the inhabitants. Mulattoes, and not whites, ought to have been employed in hewing the wood, and it should have been remembered that the expense of roads, arrastraderos, for the transport of the timber, when once laid out, would not have been the same, and that by the increase of the population, the price of day labor would progressively have diminished. It is for shipbuilders alone, who determine the localities, to judge whether, in the present state of things, the freight of merchant vessels be not far too high to admit of sending to Europe large quantities of roughly hewn wood. But it cannot be doubted that Venezuela possesses on its maritime coast, as well as on the banks of the Orinoco, immense resources for shipbuilding. The fine ships which have been launched from the dockyards of the Havana, Guayaquil, and San Blas have, no doubt, cost more than those constructed in Europe, but from the nature of tropical wood they possess the advantages of hardness and amazing durability. The great struggle during which Venezuela has fought for independence has lasted more than twelve years. That period has been no less fruitful than civil commotions usually are in heroic and generous actions, guilty errors, and violent passions. The sentiment of common danger has strengthened the ties between men of various races who, spread over the plains of Cumana or insulated on the tableland of the Cundinamarca, have a physical and moral organization as different as the climates in which they live. The mother country has several times regained possession of some districts, but as revolutions are always renewed with more violence, when the evils that produce them can no longer be remedied, these conquests have been transitory. To facilitate and give greater energy to the defense of this country, the governments have been concentrated, and a vast state has been formed, extending from the mouth of the Orinoco to the other side of the Andes of Riobamba and the banks of the Amazon. The Capitania General of Caracas has been united to the Viceroyalty of New Granada, from which it was only separated entirely in 1777. This union, which will always be indispensable for external safety, this centralization of powers in a country six times larger than Spain, has been prompted by political views. The tranquil progress of the new government has justified the wisdom of those views and the Congress will find still fewer obstacles in the execution of its beneficent projects for national industry and civilization, in proportion as it can grant increased liberty to the provinces, must render the people sensible to the advantages of institutions which they have purchased at the price of their blood. In every form of government, in republics as well as in limited monarchies, improvements, to be salutary, must be progressive. New Andalusia, Caracas, Cundinamarca, Popoyan, and Quito are not Confederate states, like Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Maryland. Without juntas or provincial legislatures, all those countries are directly subject to the Congress and the government of Colombia. In conformity with the Constitutional Act, the intendants and governors of the departments and provinces are nominated by the President of the Republic. It may be naturally supposed that such dependence has not always been deemed favorable to the liberty in the communes, which love to discuss their own local interests. The ancient kingdom of Quito, for instance, is connected by the habits and language of its mountainous inhabitants with Peru and New Granada. If there were a provincial junta, if the Congress alone determined the taxes necessary for the defense and general welfare of Colombia, the feeling of an individual political existence would render the inhabitants less interested in the choice of the spot which is the seat of the central government the same argument applies to new andalusia and guiana which are governed by intendants named by the president it may be said that these provinces have hitherto been in a position differing but little from those territories of the united states which have a population below sixty thousand souls peculiar circumstances which cannot be justly appreciated at such a distance have doubtless rendered great centralization necessary in the civil administration every change would be dangerous as long as the state has external enemies 
but the forms useful for defence are not always those which, after the struggle, sufficiently favour individual liberty and the development of public prosperity. The powerful union of North America has long been insulated and without contact with any states having analogous institutions. Although the progress America is making from east to west is considerably retarded near the right bank of the Mississippi, she will advance without interruption towards the internal provinces of Mexico, and will there find a European people of another race, other manners, and a different religious faith. Will the feeble population of those provinces, belonging to another dawning federation, resist, or will it be absorbed by the torrent from the east, and transformed into an Anglo-American state, like the inhabitants of Lower Louisiana? The future will soon solve this problem. On the other hand, Mexico is separated from Colombia only by Guatemala, a country of extreme fertility, which has recently assumed the denomination of the Republic of Central America. The political divisions between Oaxaca and Chiapa, Costa Rica and Veragua, are not founded either on the natural limits or the manners and languages of the natives, but solely on the habit of dependence on the Spanish chiefs who reside at Mexico, Guatemala, or Santa Fe de Bogotá. It seems natural that Guatemala should one day join the isthmuses of Veragua and Panama to the isthmus of Costa Rica, and that Quito should connect New Granada with Peru, as La Paz, Charcas, and Potosi link Peru with Buenos Aires. The intermediate parts from Chiapa to the Cordilleras of Upper Peru form a passage from one political association to another, like those transitory forms which link together the various groups of the organic kingdom in nature. In neighboring monarchies, the provinces that adjoin each other present those striking demarcations, which are the effect of great centralization of power in federal republics. States situated at the extremities of each system are some time before they acquire a stable equilibrium. It would be almost a matter of indifference to the provinces between Arkansas and the Rio del Norte whether they send their deputies to Mexico or to Washington. Were Spanish America one day to show a more uniform tendency toward the spirit of federalism, which the example of the United States has created on several points, there would result from the contact of so many systems or groups of states, confederations variously graduated. I here only touch on the relations that arise from this assemblage of colonies, on an uninterrupted line of 1,600 leagues in length. We have seen in North America one of the old Atlantic states divided into two, and each having a different representation. The separation of Maine and Massachusetts in 1820 was effected in the most peaceable manner. Schisms of this kind will, it may be feared, render such changes turbulent. It may also be observed that the importance of the geographical divisions of Spanish America, founded at the same time on the relations of a local position and the habits of several centuries, have prevented the mother country from retarding the separation of the colonies by attempting to establish Spanish princes in the New World. In order to rule such vast possessions, it would have been requisite to form six or seven centers of government, and that multiplicity of centers was hostile to the establishment of new dynasties at the period when they might still have been salutary to the mother country. Bacon somewhere observes that it would be happy if nations would always follow the example of time, the greatest of all innovators, but who acts calmly and almost without being perceived. This happiness does not belong to colonies when they reach the critical juncture of emancipation, and least of all to Spanish America, engaged in the struggle at first not to obtain complete independence, but to escape from a foreign yoke. May these party agitations be succeeded by a lasting tranquillity. May the germ of civil discord, disseminated during three centuries, to secure the dominion of the mother country, gradually perish, and may productive and commercial Europe be convinced that to perpetuate the political agitations of the new world would be to impoverish herself by diminishing the consumption of her productions and losing a market which already yields more than seventeen millions of piastres many years must no doubt elapse before seventeen millions of inhabitants spread over a surface one-fifth greater than the whole of europe will have found a stable equilibrium in governing themselves the most critical moment is that when nations after long oppression, find themselves suddenly at liberty to promote their own prosperity. The Spanish Americans, it is increasingly repeated, are not sufficiently advanced in intellectual cultivation to be fitted for free institutions. 
i remember that at a period not very remote the same reasoning was applied to other nations who were said to have had too great an advance in civilization experience no doubt proves that nations like individuals find that intellect and learning do not always lead to happiness but without denying the necessity of a certain mass of knowledge and popular instruction for the stability of republics or constitutional monarchies we believe that stability depends much less on the degree of intellectual improvement than on the strength of the national character on that balance of energy and tranquillity of ardour and patience which maintains and perpetuates new institutions on the local circumstances in which a nation is placed and on the political relations of a country with neighbouring states End of chapter 3.27chapter three point twenty eight of personal narrative of travels to the equinoctial regions of america during the years seventeen ninety nine to eighteen o four volume three by alexander von humboldt translated by thomasina ross this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three point twenty eight passage from the coast of venezuela to the havana general view of the population of the west india islands compared with the population of the new continent with respect to diversity of races personal liberty language and worship we sailed from nueva barcelona on the twenty fourth of november at nine o'clock in the evening and we doubled the small rocky island of borachita the night was marked by coolness which characterizes the nights of the tropics and the agreeable effect of which can only be conceived by comparing the nocturnal temperature from twenty three to twenty four degrees centigrade with the mean temperature of the day which in those latitudes is generally even on the coast from twenty eight to twenty nine degrees next day soon after the observation of noon we reached the meridian of the island of tortugas it is destitute of vegetation and like the little islands of coche and cabagua is remarkable for its small elevation above the level of the sea in the forenoon of the twenty sixth we began to lose sight of the island of margarita and i endeavoured to verify the height of the rocky group of macanao it appeared under an angle of zero degrees sixteen minutes thirty five seconds which in a distance estimated at sixty miles would give the mica slate group of macanao the elevation of about six hundred and sixty toises a result which in a zone where the terrestrial refractions are so unchanging leads me to think that the island was less distant than we supposed the dome of the silla of caracas lying sixty two degrees to the southwest long fixed our attention at those times when the coast is not loaded with vapours the sea must be visible at sea without reckoning the effects of refraction at thirty-three leagues distance during the twenty-sixth and the three following days the sea was covered with a bluish film which when examined by a compound microscope appeared formed of an innumerable quantity of filaments we frequently find these filaments in the gulf stream and the channel of bahama as well as near the coast of buenos aires some naturalists are of opinion that they are vestiges of the eggs of mollusca but they appear to be more like fragments of fusi the phosphorescence of sea-water seems however to be augmented by their presence especially between twenty eight and thirty degrees of north latitude which indicates an origin of some sort of animal nature on the twenty seventh we slowly approached the island of orchila like all the small islands in the vicinity of the fertile coast of the continent it has never been inhabited I found the latitude of the northern cape eleven degrees fifty one minutes forty four seconds and the longitude of the eastern cape sixty eight degrees twenty six minutes five seconds supposing nueva barcelona to be sixty seven degrees four minutes forty eight seconds opposite the western cape there is a small rock against which the waves beat turbulently some angles taken with the sextant gave for the length of the island from east to west eight point four miles nine thousand five hundred toises and for the breadth scarcely three miles the island of orchila which from its name i figured to myself as a bare rock covered with lichens was at that period beautifully verdant the hills of gneiss were covered with grasses it appears that the geological constitution of orchila resembles on a small scale that of margarita it consists of two groups of rocks joined by a neck of land it is an isthmus covered with sand which seems to have issued from the floods by the successive lowering of the level of the sea the rocks 
like all those which are perpendicular and insulated in the middle of the sea, appear much more elevated than they really are, for they scarcely exceed from eighty to ninety toises. The Punta Rasa stretches to the northwest and is lost, like a sandbank, below the waters. It is dangerous for navigators, and so is likewise the Mogote, which, at the distance of two miles from the western cape, is surrounded by breakers. On a very near examination of these rocks, we saw the strata of gneiss inclined toward the northwest and crossed by thick layers of quartz. The destruction of these layers has doubtless created the sands of the surrounding beach. Some clumps of trees shade the valleys. The summits of the hills are crowned with fan-leaved palm trees, probably the palma de sombrero of the llanos, Corypha tectorum. Rain is not abundant in these countries, but probably some springs might be found on the island of Orchila, if sought for with the same care as in the mica slate rocks of Punta Araya. When we recollect how many bare and rocky islands are inhabited and cultivated between the seventeenth and twenty-sixth degrees of latitude in the archipelago of the Lesser Antilles and Bahama Islands, we are surprised to find those islands desert which are near to the coast of Cumaná, Barcelona, and Caracas. They would long have ceased to be so, had they been under the dominion of any other government than that to which they belong. Nothing can engage men to circumscribe their industry within the narrow limits of a small island when a neighboring continent offers them greater advantages. We perceived at sunset the two points of the Roca de Afuera rising like towers in the midst of the ocean. A survey taken with the compass placed the most easterly of the points, or Roque, at zero degrees, nineteen minutes west of the western cape of Orchila. The clouds continued long accumulated over that island, and showed its position from afar. The influence of a small tract of land in condensing the vapors, suspended at an elevation of eight hundred toises, is a very extraordinary phenomenon, although familiar to all mariners. From this accumulation of clouds, the position of the lowest island may be recognized at a great distance. On the 29th November, we still saw very distinctly, at sunrise, the summit of the Silla of Caracas, just rising above the horizon of the sea. At noon, everything denoted a change of weather in the direction of the north. The atmosphere suddenly cooled to 12.6 degrees, while the sea maintained a temperature of 25.6 degrees at its surface. At the moment of the observation of noon, the oscillations of the horizon, crossed by streaks, or black bands, of very variable size, produced changes of refraction from three to four degrees. The sea became rough in very calm weather, and everything announced a stormy passage between Cayman Island and Cape San Antonio. On the 30th, the wind veered suddenly to the north-northeast, and the surge rose to a considerable height. Northward, a darkish blue tint was observable on the sky. The rolling of our small vessel was violent, and we perceived amidst the dashing of the waves two seas crossing each other, one from north and the other from the north-north-east. Waterspouts were formed at the distance of a mile, and were carried rapidly from north-north-east to north-north-west. Whenever the waterspout drew near us, we felt the wind grow sensibly cooler. Towards evening, owing to the carelessness of our American cook, our deck took fire, but fortunately it was soon extinguished. On the morning of the 1st of December, the sea slowly calmed, and the breeze became steady from the northeast. On the 2nd of December, we descried Cape Beata, in a spot where we had long observed the clouds gathered together. According to the observations of Archener, which I obtained in the night, we were 64 miles distant. During the night, there is a very curious optical phenomenon, which I shall not undertake to account for. At half-past midnight, the wind blew feebly from the east. The thermometer rose to 23.2 degrees. The whalebone hygrometer was at 57 degrees. I had remained upon the deck to observe the culmination of some stars. The full moon was high in the heavens. Suddenly, in the direction of the moon, 45 degrees before its passage over the meridian, a great arch was formed, tinged with the prismatic colors, though not of a bright hue. The arch appeared higher than the moon, this iris band was near two degrees broad, and its summit seemed to rise nearly from eighty to eighty-five degrees above the horizon of the sea. The sky was singularly pure. There was no appearance of rain, and what struck me most was that this phenomenon, which perfectly resembled a lunar rainbow, was not in the direction opposite to the moon. The arch remained stationary, 
or at least appeared to do so, during eight or ten minutes, and at the moment when I tried, if it were possible, to see it by reflection in the mirror of the sextant, it began to move and descend, crossing successively the moon and Jupiter. It was twelve hours fifty-four minutes mean time when the summit of the arch sank below the horizon. This movement of an arch, colored like the rainbow, filled with astonishment the sailors who were on watch on the deck. They alleged, as they do on the appearance of every extraordinary meteor, that it denoted wind. M. Arago examined the sketch of this arch in my journal, and he is of the opinion that the image of the moon reflected in the waters could not have given a halo of such great dimensions. The rapidity of the movement is no small obstacle in the way of explanation of a phenomenon well worthy of attention. On the 3rd of December we felt some uneasiness, on account of the proximity of a small vessel, supposed to be a pirate, but which, as it drew near, we recognized to be the Balandra del Freila, the sloop of the monk. I was at a loss to conceive what so strange a denomination meant. The bark belonged to a Franciscan missionary, a rich priest, of an Indian village in the savannas, Llanos, of Barcelona, who had for several years carried on a very lucrative contraband trade with the Danish islands. M. Bonpland and several passengers saw in the night at the distance of a quarter of a mile, with the wind, a small flame on the surface of the ocean. It ran in the direction of southwest and lighted up the atmosphere. No shock of earthquake was felt, and there was no change in the direction of the waves. Was it a phosphorescent gleam, produced by a great accumulation of mollusca in a state of putrefaction, or did this flame issue from the depths of the sea, as is said to have been sometimes observable in latitudes agitated by volcanoes? The latter supposition appears to me devoid of all probability. The volcanic flame can only issue from the deep when the rocky bed of the ocean is already heaved up, so that the flames and incandescent scoria escape from the swelled and creviced part without traversing the waters. At half-past ten in the morning of the 4th of December, we were in the meridian of Cape Baco, Punta Abaco, which I found in 76 degrees, 7 minutes 50 seconds, or 9 degrees, 3 minutes 2 seconds, west of Nueva Barcelona. Having attained the parallel of 17 degrees, the fear of pirates made us prefer the direct passage across the bank of Ibora, better known by the name of the Pedro Shoals. This bank occupies more than 280 square sea leagues, and its configuration strikes the eye of the geologist by its resemblance to that of Jamaica, which is in its neighborhood. It forms an island almost as large as Puerto Rico. From the 5th of December, the pilots believed they took successively the measurement at a distance of the island of Ranas, Morant Keys, Cape Portland, and Pedro Keys. They may probably have been deceived in several of these distances, which were taken from the masthead. I have elsewhere noted these measurements, not with the view of opposing them to those which have been made by able English navigators in these frequented latitudes, but merely to connect, in the same system of observations, the points I determined in the forests of the Orinoco and in the archipelago of the West Indies. The milky color of the waters warned us that we were on the eastern part of the bank. The centigrade thermometer, which at a distance from the bank and on the surface of the sea, had for several days kept at 27 and 27.3 degrees, the air being at 21.2 degrees, sank suddenly to 25.7 degrees. The weather was bad from the 4th to the 6th of December. It rained fast, thunder rolled at a distance, and the gusts of wind from the north-northeast became more and more violent. We were, during some part of the night, in a critical position. We heard before us the noise of the breakers, over which we had to pass, and we could ascertain their direction by the phosphoric gleam reflected from the foam of the sea. The scene resembled the Raudal of Garzita and other rapids which we had seen in the bed of the Orinoco. We succeeded in changing our course, and in less than a quarter of an hour we were out of danger. While we traversed the bank of the Vibora from south-south-east to north-north-west, I repeatedly tried to ascertain the temperature of the water on the surface of the sea. The cooling was less sensible on the middle of the bank than on its edge a circumstance which we attributed to the currents that they are mingled waters from different latitudes on the south of pedro keys the surface of the sea at twenty five fathoms deep was twenty six point four and at fifteen fathoms deep twenty six point two degrees the temperature of the sea on the east of the bank had been twenty six point eight degrees 
some American pilots affirm that among the Bahama Islands they often know, when seated in the cabin, that they are passing over sandbanks. They allege that the lights are surrounded with small colored halos, and that the air exhaled from the lungs is visibly condensed. The latter circumstance appears very doubtful. Below thirty degrees of latitude, the cooling produced by the waters of the bank is not sufficiently considerable to cause this phenomenon. During the time we passed, on the bank of the Vibora, the constitution of the air was quite different from what it had been when we had quitted it. The rain was circumscribed by the limits of the bank, of which we could distinguish the form from afar by the mass of vapour with which it was covered. On the ninth of December, as we advanced toward the Cayman Islands, the northeast wind again blew with violence. Note. Christopher Columbus, in 1503, named the Cayman Islands Penascales de las Tortugas, on account of the sea tortoises which he saw swimming in those latitudes. End of note. I nevertheless obtained some altitudes of the sun at the moment when we believed ourselves, though twelve miles distant, in the meridian of the center of the great Cayman, which is covered with cocoa trees. The weather continued bad, and the sea extremely rough. The wind at length fell as we neared Cape San Antonio. I found the northern extremity of the Cape, 87 degrees, 17 minutes, 22 seconds, or 2 degrees, 34 minutes, and 14 seconds, eastward of the Morro of the Havana. This is the longitude now marked on the best charts. We were at the distance of three miles from land, but we were made aware of the proximity of the island of Cuba by a delicious aromatic odor. The sailors affirm that this odor is not perceived when they approach from Cape Catoche on the barren coast of Mexico. As the weather grew clearer, the thermometer rose gradually in the shade to 27 degrees. We advanced rapidly northward, carried on by a current from south-south-east, the temperature of which rose at the surface of the water to 26.7 degrees, while out of the current it was 24.6 degrees. We anchored in the port of the Havana on the 19th of December, after a passage of 25 days in continuous bad weather. End of chapter 3.28Chapter 3.29, Part 1 of Personal Narrative of Travels to the Equinoctial Regions of America during the years 1799 to 1804, Volume 3, by Alexander von Humboldt, translated by Thomasina Ross. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3.29, Part 1 Political Essay on the Island of Cuba, the Havana, Hills of Guanabacoa considered in their geological relations. Valley of Los Guinas, Batabano, and the port of Trinidad, the King and Queen's Gardens. Cuba owes its political importance to a variety of circumstances, among which may be enumerated the extent of its surface, the fertility of its soil, its naval establishments, and the nature of its population, of which three-fifths are free men. All these advantages are heightened by the admirable position of the Havana. The northern part of the Caribbean Sea, known by the name of the Gulf of Mexico, forms a circular basin more than 250 leagues in diameter. It is a Mediterranean with two outlets. The island of Cuba, or rather its coast, between Cape San Antonio and the town of Matanzas, situated at the opening of the Old Channel, closes the Gulf of Mexico on the southeast, leaving the ocean current known by the name of the Gulf Stream, no other outlet on the south, than a strait between Cape St. Antonio and Cape Catoche, and no other on the north than the Channel of Bahama, between Bahia Honda and the Shoals of Florida. Near the northern outlet, where the highways of so many nations may be said to cross each other, lies the fine port of the Havana, fortified at once by nature and by art. The fleets which sail from this port, and which are partly constructed of the Cidrella and the Mahogany of the island of Cuba, might, at the entrance of the Mexican Mediterranean, menace the opposite coast, as the fleets that sail from Cadiz command the Atlantic near the Pillars of Hercules. In the meridian of the Havana, the Gulf of Mexico, the Old Channel, and the Channel of Bahama unite. The opposite direction of the currents and the violent agitations of the atmosphere at the setting in of winter impart a peculiar character to these latitudes at the extreme limit of the equinoctial zone. The island of Cuba is the largest of the Antilles, Note. Its area is little less in extent than that of England, not including Wales. End of note. 
its long and narrow form gives it a vast development of coast and places it in proximity with haiti and jamaica with the most southern province of the united states florida and the most easterly province of the mexican confederation yucatan Note. These places are brought into communication with one another by a voyage of ten or twelve days. End of note. This circumstance claims serious attention when it is considered that Jamaica, St. Domingo, Cuba, and the southern parts of the United States, from Louisiana to Virginia, contain nearly two million eight hundred thousand Africans. Since the separation of St. Domingo, the Floridas, and New Spain from the mother country, the island of Cuba is connected only by a similarity of religion, language, and manners with the neighboring countries which, during ages, were subject to the same laws. Florida forms the last link in that long chain, the northern extremity of which reaches the basin of St. Lawrence, and extends from the region of palm trees to that of the most rigorous winter. The inhabitant of New England regards the increasing augmentation of the black population, the preponderance of the slave states, and the predilection for the cultivation of colonial products as a public danger, and earnestly wishes that the Strait of Florida the present limit of the great american confederation may never be passed but with the views of free trade founded on equal rights if he fears events which may place the havana under the dominion of a european power more formidable than spain he is not the less desirous that the political ties by which louisiana pensacola and st augustine of florida were heretofore united to the island of cuba may be for ever broken the extreme sterility of the soil joined to the want of inhabitants and of cultivation, have at all times rendered the proximity of Florida of small importance to the trade of the Havana, but the case is different on the coast of Mexico. The shores of that country, stretching in a semicircle from the frequented ports of Tampico, Veracruz, and Alvarado to Cape Catoche, almost touch, by the peninsula of Yucatan, the western part of the island of Cuba. Commerce is extremely active between the Havana and the port of Campeche, and it increases notwithstanding the new order of things in mexico because the trade equally illicit with a more distant coast that of caracas or colombia employs but a small number of vessels in such difficult times the supply of salt meat tasajo for the slaves is more easily obtained from buenos aires and the plains of merida than from those of cumana barcelona and caracas the island of cuba and the archipelago of the philippines have for ages derived from new spain the funds necessary for their internal administration and for keeping up their fortifications arsenals and dockyards the havana was the military port of the new world and till eighteen o eight annually received one million eight hundred thousand piastres from the mexican treasury at madrid it was long the custom to consider the island of cuba and the archipelago of the philippines as dependencies on mexico situated at very unequal distances east and west of veracruz and acapulco but linked to the mexican metropolis then a european colony by all the ties of commerce mutual aid and ancient sympathies increased internal wealth has rendered unnecessary the pecuniary succor formerly furnished to cuba from the mexican treasury of all the spanish possessions that island has been most prosperous the port of havana has since the troubles of st domingo become one of the most important points of the commercial world a fortunate concurrence of political circumstances joined to the intelligence and commercial activity of the inhabitants have preserved to the havana the uninterrupted enjoyment of free intercourse with foreign nations i twice visited this island residing there on one occasion for three months and on the other for six weeks and i enjoyed the confidence of persons who from their abilities and their position, were enabled to furnish me with the best information. In company with M. Bonplan, I visited only the vicinity of the Havana, the beautiful valley of Guinness, and the coast between Batabano and the port of Trinidad. After having succinctly described the aspect of this scenery, and the singular modifications of a climate so different from that of the other islands, I will proceed to examine the general population of the island of Cuba, its area calculated from the most accurate sketch of the coast the objects of trade and the state of the public revenue the aspect of the havana at the entrance of the port is one of the gayest and most picturesque on the shore of equinoctial america north of the equator this spot is celebrated by travellers of all nations 
it boasts not the luxuriant vegetation that adorns the banks of the river guayaquil nor the wild majesty of the rocky coast of rio de janeiro but the grace which in those climates embellishes the scenes of cultivated nature is of the havana mingled with the majesty of vegetable forms and the organic vigor that characterizes the torrid zone on entering the port of the havana you pass between the fortress of the moro castilla de los santos reyes and the fort of san salvador de la punta the opening being only from one hundred and seventy to two hundred toises wide having passed this narrow entrance leaving on the north the fine castle of san carlos de la cabana and the casa blanca we reach a basin in the form of a trefoil of which the great axis stretching from south southwest to north northeast is two miles and one-fifth long this basin communicates with three creeks those of regla guanavacoa and atares in this last there are some springs of fresh water the town of the havana surrounded by walls forms a promontory bounded on the south by the arsenal and on the north by the fort of la punta after passing beyond some wrecks of vessels sunk in the shoals of la luz we no longer find eight or ten but five or six fathoms of water the castles of santo domingo de atares and san carlos del principe defend the town on the westward they are distant from the interior wall on the land side the one six hundred and sixty toises the other one thousand two hundred and forty the intermediate space is filled by the suburbs arabales or barrios extramuros of horcon jesu maria guadalupe and senor de la salud which from year to year encroach on the fields of mars campo del marte the great edifices of the havana the cathedral the casa del gobierno the house of the commandant of the marine the correo or general post office and the factory of tobacco are less remarkable for beauty than for solidity of structure the streets are for the most part narrow and unpaved stones being brought from vera cruz and very difficult of transport the idea was conceived a short time before my voyage of joining great trunks of trees together as is done in germany and russia when dikes are constructed across marshy places this project was soon abandoned and travellers newly arrived beheld with surprise fine trunks of mahogany sunk in the mud of the havana at the time of my sojourn there few towns of spanish america presented owing to the want of a good police a more unpleasant aspect people walked in mud up to the knee and the multitude of caleche or volant the characteristic equipage of the havana of carts loaded with casks of sugar and porters elbowing passengers rendered walking most disagreeable the smell of tasajo often poisons the houses and the winding streets but it appears that of late the police has interposed and that a manifest improvement has taken place in the cleanliness of the streets that the houses are more airy and that the calle de los mercadores presents a fine appearance here as in the oldest towns of europe an ill-traced plan of streets can only be amended by slow degrees there are two fine public walks one called the alameda between the hospital of santa paula and the theatre and the other between the castillo de la punta and the puerta de la murala called the paseo extramuros the latter is deliciously cool and is frequented by carriages after sunset it was begun by the marquis de la torre governor of the island who gave the first impulse to the improvement of the police and the municipal government don luis de la casas and the count of santa clara enlarged the plantations near the campo de marta is the botanical garden which is well worthy to fix the attention of the government and another place fitted to excite at once pity and indignation the barracoon in front of which the wretched slaves are exposed for sale a marble statue of charles the third has been erected since my return to europe in the extramuros walk this spot was at first destined for a monument to christopher columbus whose ashes after the cession of the spanish part of st domingo were brought to the island of cuba Note columbus lies buried in the cathedral of the havana close to the wall near the high altar on the tomb is the following inscription o restos y imagen del gran colon mil siglos duran grandados en la urna y an remembranca de nuestra nación o relics and image of the great colon columbus a thousand ages are encompassed in thy urn and in memory of our nation his remains were first deposited at valladolid and thence were removed to seville in fifteen thirty six the bodies of columbus and of his son diego el andalantado 
were carried to St. Domingo, and there interred in the cathedral, but they were afterwards removed to the place where they now repose. End of note. The same year, the ashes of Fernando Cortez were transferred in Mexico from one church to another. Thus, at the close of the 18th century, the remains of the two greatest men who promoted the conquest of America were interred in new sepulchres. The most majestic palm tree of its tribe, the Palma Real, imparts a peculiar character to the landscape in the vicinity of the Havana. It is the Oreodoxa Regia, of our description of American palm trees. Its tall trunk, slightly swelled toward the middle, grows to the height of sixty or eighty feet. The upper part is glossy, of a delicate green, newly formed by the closing and dilation of the petioles, contrasts with the rest, which is whitish and fendilated. It appears like two columns, the one surmounting the other. The palmo real of the island of Cuba has feathery leaves, rising perpendicularly toward the sky and curved only at the point. The form of this plant reminded us of the Vagdaya palm, which covers the rocks and the cataracts of the Orinoco, balancing its long points over a mist of foam. Here, as in every place where the population is concentrated, vegetation diminishes. Those palm trees round the Havana and in the amphitheatre of Regla, on which I delighted to gaze, are disappearing by degrees. The marshy places, which I saw covered with bamboos, are cultivated and drained. Civilization advances, and the soil, gradually stripped of plants, scarcely offers any trace of its wild abundance. From the Punta to San Lazaro, from Cabana to Regla, and from Regla to Atares, the road is covered with houses, and those that surround the bay are of light and elegant construction. The plan of these houses is traced out by the owners, and they are ordered from the United States, like pieces of furniture. When the yellow fever rages at the Havana, the proprietors withdraw to those country houses, and to the hills between Regla and Guanavacoa, to breathe a purer air. In the coolness of night, when the boats cross the bay, and owing to the phosphorescence of the water, leave behind them long tracks of light, these romantic scenes afford charming and peaceful retreats for those who wish to withdraw from the tumult of a populous city. To judge of the progress of cultivation, travellers should visit the small plots of maize and other alimentary plants, the rows of pineapples, ananas, in the fields of Cruz de Piedra, and the bishop's garden, Quinta del Obispo, which of late is become a delicious spot. The town of the Havana, properly so called, surrounded by walls, is only nine hundred toises long and five hundred broad. Yet more than forty-four thousand inhabitants, of whom twenty-six thousand are negroes and mulattoes, are crowded together in this narrow space. A population nearly as considerable occupies the two great suburbs of Jesu Maria and La Salud. Note. Salud signifies health. End of note. The latter place does not verify the name it bears. The temperature of the air is indeed lower than in the city, but the streets might have been larger and better planned. Spanish engineers, who have been waging war for thirty years past with the inhabitants of the suburbs, Arabales, have convinced the government that the houses are too near the fortifications, and that the enemy might establish himself there with impunity. But the government has not courage to demolish the suburbs and disperse a population of twenty-eight thousand inhabitants collected in La Salud only since the great fire of eighteen o two that quarter has been considerably enlarged barracks were at first constructed but by degrees they have been converted into private houses the defence of the havana on the west is of the highest importance so long as the besieged are masters of the town properly so called and of the southern part of the bay the moro and la cabana they are impregnable because they can be provisioned by the havana and the losses of the garrison repaired I have heard well-informed French engineers observe that an enemy should begin its operations by taking the town in order to bombard the cabana, a strong fortress, but where the garrison, shut up in the casements, could not long resist the insalubrity of the climate. The English took the Moro without being masters of the Havana, but the cabana and the fort number four which commands the Moro did not then exist. The most important works on the south and west are the Castillos de Atares y de Principe, and the battery of santa clara we employed the months of december january and february in making observations in the vicinity of the havana and the fine plains of guinas we experienced in the family of senor cuesta who then formed with senor santa maria one of the greatest commercial houses in america and in the house of count o'reilly the most generous hospitality 
we lived with the former and deposited our collections and instruments in the spacious hotel of count o'reilly where the terraces favoured our astronomical observations the longitude of the havana was at this period more than one-fifth of a degree uncertain Note. i also fixed by direct observations several positions in the interior of the island of cuba namely rio blanco a plantation of count yaraco y mopex the almirante a plantation of the countess buenavista san antonio de peritia the village of managua san antonio de pareto and the fondadero near the town of san antonio de los banos End of note. it had been fixed by m espinosa the learned director of the deposito hydrográfico of madrid at five degrees thirty-eight minutes eleven seconds in a table of positions which he communicated to me on leaving madrid m de churuca fixed the morrow at five hours thirty-nine minutes one second i met at the havana with one of the most able officers of the spanish navy captain don dionisio galliano who had taken a survey of the coast of the strait of magellan we made observations together on a series of eclipses of the satellites of jupiter of which the mean result gave five hours thirty-eight minutes fifty seconds m altmans deducted in eighteen o five the whole of those observations which are marked for the morrow at five hours thirty-eight minutes twenty two point five seconds forty eight degrees forty three minutes seven point five seconds west of the meridian of paris this longitude was confirmed by fifteen occultations of stars observed from eighteen o nine to eighteen eleven and calculated by m ferret that excellent observer fixes the definitive result at five degrees thirty eight minutes fifty point nine seconds with respect to the magnetic dip i found it by the compass of borda december eighteen hundred fifty three degrees twenty two minutes of the old sexagesimal division twenty two years before according to the very accurate observations made by captain sabine in his memorable voyage to the coasts of africa america and spitzbergen the dip was only fifty one degrees fifty five minutes it had therefore diminished one degree twenty seven minutes the island of cuba being surrounded with shoals and breakers along more than two-thirds of its length and as ships keep out beyond those dangers the real shape of the island was for a long time unknown its breadth especially between the havana and the port of batabano has been exaggerated and it is only since the deposito hidrográfico of madrid published the observations of captain don jose del rio and lieutenant don ventura de barcaizaguetui that the area of the land of cuba could be calculated with any accuracy wishing to furnish in this work the most accurate result that can be obtained in the present state of our astronomical knowledge i engaged m bauza to calculate the area he found in june eighteen thirty five the surface of the island of cuba without the isla dos pinos to be three thousand five hundred and twenty square leagues and with that island three thousand six hundred and fifteen from this calculation which has been twice repeated it results that the island of cuba is one-seventh less than has hitherto been believed that it is thirty-two one-hundredths larger than haiti or santo domingo that its surface equals that of portugal and within one-eighth that of england without wales and that if the whole archipelago of the antilles presents as great an area as the half of spain the island of cuba alone almost equals in surface the other great and small antilles its greatest length from cape san antonio to point Maisy, in a direction from west southwest to east northeast and from west northwest to east southeast is two hundred and twenty seven leagues and its greatest breadth in the direction north and south from point matranillo to the mouth of the magdalena near peak tarquino is thirty-seven leagues the mean breadth of the island on four-fifths of its length between the havana and puerto principe is fifteen leagues in the best cultivated part between the havana and batabano the isthmus is only eight sea leagues among the great islands of the globe that of java most resembles the island of cuba in its form and area four thousand one hundred and seventy square leagues cuba has a circumference of coast of five hundred and twenty leagues of which two hundred and eighty belong to the south shore between cape san antonio and punta Mesi. end of chapter three point twenty nine part one